Welcome, Anna, to Wealth Matters Podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for attending and joining me. Uh, and uh, I want to remind listeners that Anna is one of the co-author in my book, Resilience, How to Turn Your Setback into a Comeback. I read her story and it was really touching. So I decided to reach out to her and you know have her on the podcast. So here Thank you so much. So Anna, uh, what do you do? So primarily, I would say that I am a real estate investor. I am basically and have been for several years a part-time real estate investor in that I do have a corporate job in the financial industry and um, started out as a private banker oh, for wow. a private bank in a, in a large bank and have worked um, since then in insurance working with a lot of um, hedge fund related insurance investments. So I do that during the day and then I invest in real estate almost every other waking moment. Um, so I have, have built a, a nice uh, multi-million dollar rental portfolio that brings in you know more passive income really at this point than what I make for my six figure job. That so nice. it's done really, really well and um, I am planning to retire this year and just continue to do real estate full time. Wow, way to go. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. So this this is what can um, show us listeners that, you know, you can build a multi-million dollar portfolio while working at your day job. Absolutely. So that, that's awesome. And it, it's pretty interesting also that you came from finance, then insurance industry and real estate. So, of course, you, you knew how bad this is going. Yes, I did. You know, one of the things that happened was about 20 years ago when I was going through my training to become a financial advisor, you know, we helped the people with the top 10% of the wealth in our bank to figure out where to put their money and where they should invest it uh, to preserve their wealth and to grow their wealth and, and to create some, some income. And of course, we did that with very traditional investments, uh, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, yeah. annuities that type of thing. And one thing that I noticed, and, and it, it happened after a conversation with one of my clients, was, you know, here I was, this girl in my young 20s, trying to tell them what to do to make money. And many of them, all of them probably at the time, had significantly more money than I did. <laughs> and I noticed that a common thread was that many of them owned real estate. And so even back in the early 90s, um, when annuity payouts were maybe seven or eight percent and people were saying you know the stock market would be 10 to 12 to 15 they were doing much better in real estate than than even those rates and you know now people are lucky lucky to get two percent in a cd and the stock market isn't doing so well so um, it just was enough to pique my interest and make me say you know one day when i have money i'm gonna buy real estate and uh finally i i got smart enough to to start investing yeah, no, that, that's a great story. So uh, as you said, one day when you have money, but uh, actually you don't have to wait till you have money. Right? That's right. Yeah. And I started with no money. So. Oh, really? Oh, tell, <laughs> tell us about that. I would really love to know. <laughs> sure. Um, so and feel free to stop me at any point. But sure. <laughs> uh, the first time that I, I bought something, actually, I was renting an apartment in Houston. And apartment rent, you know, even back in the late 90s was like a thousand twelve hundred dollars a month for a one-bedroom apartment and I realized I'm throwing all this money away so I'm just gonna buy a little condo instead of renting so back then they had a hundred percent financing program and I Ooh. bought a little condo and um, was like okay I felt really good about myself because I owned something and I wasn't you know quote unquote throwing money away at rent so fast forward a little bit um, my, I, I got married and my husband and I were looking to buy a home and we thought, you know, maybe what we'll do is buy a home that's really nice in an area that's up and coming where you don't really want to live yet, but we think in a year or two, they're going to be worth, you know, significantly more because of all the growth that was happening literally just blocks away from us. And so 
we started just thinking, okay, let's kind of house hack our way into something that's going to be worth more in the future and, um, and did that. And then right about that time in 2003, I had my first child oh, and okay. I had really been climbing the corporate ladder. And my thought was, you know, I'm going to continue to um, go higher and higher up in the financial industry. And that's where I'm going to make money. But I tell you, the moment I heard, I heard and felt and held that first baby, all of my drive to succeed in the corporate world quickly diminished <laughs> to just wanting to be the best mom you know I could possibly be. And so I thought I'd love to be able to just stay home with this baby. But given where we were in our life and just starting out, um, like many people today, my husband had a six-figure school loan to pay off when oh, he got wow. out of chiropractic college. Yes. And so, you know, we, all of his income, his first year out of chiropractic college really just went to pay down his school loans oh. and we lived on my salary. So I wasn't able to do that and it just broke my heart. And while I was on maternity leave, all the shows started coming out about flipping houses. You know, you can flip this house and make a hundred thousand dollars right away. And back then I made, you know, might've made 70, $75,000 a year. And I thought I could flip one house and quit my job and be home with my kids. So what did I do? I didn't really know anything other than I had a generally good um, financial mind, you know, that thought through finances and things like that fairly well but I didn't know anybody flipping houses. The shows only show you the glamorous side right. and don't tell you any details. Yeah. And back then I didn't know anybody doing it. So I went out and got a traditional mortgage to buy a property uh -huh. and hired uh, some friends of our babysitter who <laughs> did some contracting on the side. Um, you know, they weren't licensed and, and most of them probably weren't here legally but they built houses for people. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll hire you. But don't <laughs> and, say that out loud. <laughs> well, but that, you know, that's how, that's how it was all done. And so I said, okay, you know, you guys know what you're doing. I'll, I'll trust you to help me, help me flip this house. So <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes in that first house flip. We bought again in an area that was really up and coming and we bought um, right before the economy and the housing market really started to crash, but it was just a couple years before when things were slowing and we didn't realize it. Um, so I bought at the wrong time. I bought a house on a street that was facing the back parking lot of a grocery store, which was like rule number one that you never buy in a bad location. Right. Um, I love that's that why too. I got a deal. Yeah. yeah. I got a deal because of where it was located, but it turned out not to be such a great deal. And um, we over improved it. You know, these were old Victorian homes that people were restoring, um, top dollar, you know, remodel, really nice. And then people were making a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars on these flips. So I thought we would do the same thing. And basically, long story short, it took a long time to sell. We were over budget. And my husband actually lost his job during that time. So uh -oh. I had a less than one year old baby two mortgage payments, a house flip we were desperate to sell, and finally sold the house and thought, you know what, it's not as glamorous as it looks, maybe we won't do this again. <laughs> and so I wish I hadn't done that, but at that point I kind of said, okay, I'm done with flipping And um, at that point. And then we regrouped and we moved to Pennsylvania from Texas, where my husband started his chiropractic business. And um, in order to find space, you know, leasing space was extremely expensive. And we found a building that had a commercial space on the bottom and two apartments on top and then some garages in the back and an apartment above that. And I thought, you know what, why don't we buy this building? It has tenants. So the tenants will basically produce enough rental income to cover the mortgage. And even if the business takes a while to get, you know, up and running, we will be okay. So that was in 2007. And I really inherited tenants just out of necessity, not because I was really thinking about being a real estate investor at that point. Um, but after about a year of doing that and realizing, yeah, this is pretty nice. These people are paying all of our expenses. 
-hmm. we decided to house hack an, another building. So we, we had sold a beautiful big home in Houston and we downsized into a little four unit apartment building where we oh, lived wow. in one unit and had three tenants. And my job basically transferred with me as a work from home opportunity on a trial basis. So there was no guarantee that I was going to keep my job. And because my husband started a business with several hundred thousand dollars of debt to get started, I felt like the only wise and safe thing to do was to house hack and at least have our living expenses, uh, mortgage and insurance covered by tenants. And that's how we got started in 07 and 08. Wow. Um, right before the economy kind of started to crash. Interesting story. So where are you now? How many units? Sure. So right now, and, and just to, you know, kind of piggyback off the tail end of that story. So after the economy crashed, um, I bought another four unit building because my 401k was almost cut in half overnight. Yeah, and nice. um, I thought, well, at least I can borrow my own 401k money and buy another four units. So that was in 08 and we basically had 12 units at that point. And that's all I bought until about five years ago. So we focused on, you know, building my husband's chiropractic business and renovating and rehabbing all of the units of our 12 unit buildings and then raising the values of that. And I kept asking banks to refinance or give me a cash out refi loan and let me take the cash from the equity to go buy more. And the answer year after year was no, 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 no. And, you know, because it was after the, the economic oh, collapse yeah. and, and banks were just so tight. So it took a while. Right. It did take a while. And okay. I kept thinking, you know, if only I could get to my equity, I could grow real estate. But during that time, I also had four more children or three more children, four total. So I, um, you know, just focused until five years ago, just building my husband's business, redoing those 12 units, raising my kids. And about five years ago, I decided, you know, I know that if I spend more time now that my bank will let me borrow quite a bit of equity from these 12 units to buy more, if we could just buy some more distressed small multifamily buildings and renovate the buildings, raise the rents, cut the expenses, we could quickly grow our rental portfolio um, to, to a six figure passive income. And so I laid out a plan five years ago to create six figures in rental income by using sweat equity, buying right, and forcing the appreciation so that I could then, you know, refi cash out and continue to do it. So as of December, um, I had 60 units of my own. That's awesome. Um, yeah, about $6 million worth, I'd say. Nice. And then in December, I partnered with um, some other investors on my first larger multifamily complex, which was about a $6.5 million 73-unit apartment complex with another 44 garages. And where, so, was, where is this? This is right outside of where I am near Hershey, Pennsylvania. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So is that so, your market where you invest mostly uh, in Pennsylvania? Or yes, primarily. Other? So, you know, because of really because of necessity and how busy I am as, as someone who works full time and has four children that are very, very active in sports and, you know, take every moment from the time they get home till they go to bed. Right. I really didn't have the time to look out of state and build teams and, and try to grow that way. So I just decided to focus on what we could kind of you know, keep our hands and our eyes on within about 20 to 30 minutes of where we live initially. Um, since then, I have bought a couple of vacation rentals in Maryland, and I'm about to buy a vacation rental in Texas. Um, and now that I'm really kind of shifting gears toward larger apartment buildings with partners where they are easier to manage because you can afford full-time property management companies, full-time, you know, right. maintenance on site, I am looking outside of Pennsylvania where there is opportunity, financial stability, uh, growth. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking all over the country. Yeah, but and you, I, you can partner with people, right? So that's for sure. advantage. So you can scale up. Exactly. So my plan is once I retire from my job here in a couple months to uh, really begin to do a little bit more traveling and building some teams in the markets where I want to be. I'm already, you know, doing some of that and working with brokers and 
other investors and some lenders that are um, ready to do something when I find the right deal. That's great. So can you tell us uh, more about the last deal you did uh, with partners? Sure. If you don't mind. Absolutely. So this was a deal I had been looking for the right larger complex for a while. And as many of your listeners and you probably know, you know, right now we are kind of at the top of a market cycle yeah. or at least very close. And so very close. it is a seller's market. Um, properties are priced at a point, you know, people will quibble over whether you can really say they're overpriced or not, but based on where we are in the market cycle and the economy, you know, we are in one of the largest um, periods of expansion, expansion. Yep. since Abraham Lincoln, believe it or not. So really? we are due for a correction of some sort. Um, you know, economists will argue whether, you know, we're going toward recession or whether we're going toward inflation and, you know, when that might be. But I just feel like so many assets right now are, are way overpriced and where you might be able to buy something at like a, a six or seven cap <laughs> complex, meaning you'd basically get six or seven percent return on your money if you paid cash. Um, I don't know that those complexes really are uh, attractive when you compare what you can get as a cash on cash or rate, um, internal rate of return on other investments, right. unless you find the right asset that still needs to, you know, have uh, forced appreciation and, and true value add. So um, I was searching for the right deal. Didn't really find anything out of state that I felt like was a slam dunk value add uh, project. And I came across an off market deal here in my backyard, literally 20 minutes from my house. That's great. And Yes, and, and the prior owners were both retiring. It was a father and son who had built and managed these properties since the 80s. And basically, they had done all the heavy lifting on the CapEx on the exterior. So it had new roofs, new uh, patios and porches, new siding, new landscape oh, and wow. hardscape. Yes, new blacktop. I mean, everything was just uh, in really good perfect. shape. It was really nice. And then they had ex they had already replaced, you know, a lot of the um, external AC right. units. So there was very little um, deferred maintenance on the property. But what it didn't have, which made it a better investment for me, is that many of these units had tenants that had been there a really long time, and they have had no rent increases for years. And because the property was in my backyard, I know the market really, really well. I know what rents really should be because it's the same tenant pool that I have for my 60 units that are really close by. And I knew that the units were all about $195 to $210 under market rent. Um, and this is times probably 70 of the 73 units. So when you can find properties that really don't need a significant amount of capital improvements to be able to raise the rents, um, it, it becomes a much more attractive investment. And so we, uh, I got it under contract, negotiated with the seller, and feel very blessed because he was actually listing it with one of the large brokers the following week. He already had all of the marketing materials, the, offer, uh, the offering memorandum, he had this, the document to sign to list it with the broker and then I uh, approached him and said, please let me take an opportunity to look at this thing and, and let's, let's make it work. So um, part of the reason I probably got that deal is I had an acquaintance relationship with the seller. I didn't know him real well, but we knew of each other well enough um, that he was at least able to, to let me make a stab at it. So I got it under contract. And I approached um, another investor in my area who does great things in real estate. I mean, they have a, a brokerage, they employ agents. Uh, he flips 50 or 60 properties a year oh, wow. and owns, you know, ab about 200 units of his own portfolio as well. So uh, we had been talking about partnering together on something. And yeah. when I found the deal, brought him in and, and we worked out what we wanted to do with it. And we're preparing to syndicate it. And we reached out, we were, so we were going to syndicate the, um, in the down payment and then go after the, the agency financing for 30 right. years. 
And the first investor that we thought of and approached um, wanted to do the deal. And so we really didn't have to go outside of um, our first investor to, to raise money. So it was the three of us that partnered on it. Um, That's great. Yeah, it worked out really well. Yeah, not not easy, but easier oh, yeah. than syndicating, I think. Yeah. That easier than syndicating, right? For sure. On trying to market and yeah. Exactly, and you know, it was one of those things yeah. that um, I learned a lot because most of what I've bought before, I bought with my own money, and so um, or or money from equity that I had built up. You're right. And I had a couple of deals where I've partnered with one person on something. Um, that have gone really, really well. But anytime you add more than one partner or one partner has significantly more money in the deal than you do, there's just a lot of getting to know each other, give yes. and take, you know, finding out what's most important to each person and, and how you can make everyone happy. I agree. Um, you know, being, being willing to negotiate and compromise and, and come up with a plan. So really the the most difficult part of the acquisition was just working with you know, the seller's attorneys and then each of my partner's attorneys and, you know, coming up with operating agreements and the way we were going to run things. Um, but, but it went pretty smoothly. Um, you know, we got really nice agency financing on it and, and that went really, really well. So um, I will do those kinds of deals all day long um, compared to just, you know, one-off deals all by myself. Yeah, no, I think uh, after a while, if you want to scale up, you want to partner, right? Or bring into a syndication so you can acquire larger complexes. Yeah, I, I think for the right person. The, the one thing I would just caveat that with, and, and I think this probably comes a little bit just from my my background as, as an advisor, is that you know every person and every family has a different niche that might be best suited for them. So where some people really um, can't give up control. They want to have complete control. Um, they want to self-manage. They or they don't have a lot of funds, but they've got you know their hands and they can put in sweat equity. They might be happier just buying stuff for their own por own portfolio and and never scaling. You know, just because it's what kind of fits their family. Um, other people don't really have money or time to commit to. Um, single family homes or smaller multis. And so they might be better suited to uh, try to partner and bring something to the table with other investors on a larger multifamily deal. Um, or, you know, maybe they've got a lot of money and they don't have time. So they want to invest passively or, or as a hybrid limited and general partner. So, you know, I think different investments work best for different people. Um, and I personally really like having my small rentals as well, because they're hundred percent mine. So right. where I go after the multifamily deal and I'm partnering with, you know, two or more people, one of them might want to sell when I don't want to sell yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. you know, something could happen in someone's family that they just need their money out and they, they just can't stay in the investment. And so you don't have as much control unless you really have, um, you know, most of the money in the deal. So it's more difficult to kind of bank on that income long term more than say, okay, this is what I think I'm going to get from this thing for the next, you know, five to 10 years. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think if you can kind of have some diversification, you know, just like with any other investment, diversify your holdings so that you've got things that you're in complete control of. Um, you're always going to have them until you decide that you don't want them. And then you've got these other bigger deals that help you to scale um, and create some some faster income that's also generally going to be less uh, maintenance intensive for you personally. You know, I, I, I think having some diversification is important. I, I'm so glad that I asked you that question. And, and I'm glad that you brought up diversification. Uh, that's exactly what I do. And I recommend as well that I have my own single family, uh, duplexes, fourplexes, nine, uh, nine unit, as well as I have invested with other syndicators. So yes. I can enjoy uh, some of the fruits passively as well, right? Exactly. And, and I may not be able to invest like in those markets. Let's say, uh, uh, you know, investing in a Mahogany Bay Villas resort in Belize, I wouldn't have been able to do that on my own. Absolutely. Uh, so, and I'm glad to hear you say that. That's an investment that actually really interests me. Did you invest with the real estate guys? Yes. 
Wonderful. I Wonderful. actually went and uh, checked it out as well last January. So if you want to talk about it, we can chat about it after the recording. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But yeah, that's another good point too, is, you know, even having vacation rentals. So I have two vacation rentals out of state that are high end luxury beach houses. You know, one of them we enjoy over the summer and we, we take family vacations there and then we rent it out the rest of the time to cover all of our expenses and basically make it a free vacation. Yeah. Um, and we are actually in our apartment complex turning two of our units into Airbnb units. Oh, you are. Will be That's short term cool. rentals. Yeah. Wow. So, so diversification is great. There's all kinds of ways to skin the cat and yeah, to make money. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then you are uh, not tied to one type of uh, real estate or one type of market either. Right? right. And I think that's really important because, you know, as we were just saying, the large multifamily deals, so many of them are overpriced right now. Yes. Um, or they're just difficult to find or maybe our major reposition at, you know, assets where you're going to have to go in and, and take some significant risk and significant CapEx investment to get those things to turn around. Um, not everybody has the stomach to handle that type of reposition. And yes. if it takes you a little longer to find the larger deals, you don't want to be out of the game. It's better to go after the smaller deals that, that are opportunities that come your way and say, hey, for the money that I've got and the time that I have, um, right now, maybe I'm not finding the multifamily I want, but what about a four unit over here or an eight unit over here, you know, while you're waiting for that right deal on the larger space? Yeah, again, uh, you know, I'm, I'm learning a lot actually today. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so great. Another, another great point, yeah. Because every mom and pop is trying to invest in multifamily. They are all into 70 units or 100 plus units, so it's hard to find deals. But that does not mean that you can just wait on the sidelines and you know wait for a deal to pop up, right? So I I agree. Right, and I think too, a lot of it depends on you know coming back to your goals and your vision. You know, different people invest for different reasons, and so what might not look like a good deal for me might be a great deal for somebody else and what their goals are. So, as, as I mentioned, the last five years, my real goal was to create significant cash flow so that I could replace my six figure job and I could retire and really have that time freedom um, of not having a corporate job. And so for me, you know, there may be a, a great property that might have a ton of equity and I'm buying it really cheap or I can get, you know, great financing, but if it's not going to cash flow real well, it may be a great investment for someone else, but just not for me right now. And so you know, you have other investors who are multifamily investors that have sold while the market's high and now they've got a lot of cash. And so they might be a little less picky on the return that they might get on that cash because they certainly don't want to put it in the stock market right now. And, you know, maybe they're more passive and they don't want to you know, buy any little stuff. So they may pay for something that seems overpriced just to be able to get a six, seven, eight percent return on their money. So everybody's different. Their goals are different. And you just got to figure out, you know, instead of saying my goal is to buy a multifamily or my goal is, goal is to buy a single family, you really need to ask yourself, what is my goal financially? Because all these right. different types of assets are just vehicles to get you to where you want to go to meet that goal. Totally agree. Awesome. So we are, we are going to change the change some gears here and I, I'll ask you some questions. Sure. So, uh, like what's your sweet spot? What kind of deals do you um, buy in, right? Value add, uh, is it certain number of units, et cetera? Or? So I think that my sweet spot is in general cash flowing rental real estate. Um, <laughs> while I really like the large multifamily deals for a lot of the reasons that we talked about, and that is kind of where my primary focus right now is finding the right value add multifamily properties for myself and my partners and syndicating those deals. Um, I'm educating people on the um, wisdom and in investing in rental property um, and how to do it conservatively and wisely. Um, so some of the people that I, I talk to who might want to invest with me you know, understand that it's complicated and they don't have the time to invest, but they've got money to invest. So I'm spending some time educating people on 
you know, why multifamily so that they may be able to invest when I have the right deal available to them. Um, I also mentor and coach, uh, have a real heart for helping other women to accomplish what I've been able to do um, to get to a point where I can retire and be home with my babies. So I have kind of stepped up some of the coaching that I do. Um, and, and then from an investment standpoint, really targeting primarily the larger projects. But at the same time, I have a duplex under contract that I'm closing next week. I have a flip that we are listing today uh, in another town, not too far from me. And I have another single family home under contract right now that I am planning on um, putting a tenant buyer in. So, you know, if there's opportunity and it's going to make money, and I think it's a nice property that um, I would be happy to either hold or sell, then I'm not going to say no to the opportunity just because it's not the larger multi. That's a great point. Thank you. So what has been your best deal so far? Um, I can think of a couple because they're all great deals for different reasons, but obviously I really like the most recent deal, the multifamily deal uh, that I put together for myself and my partners because it made me step out of my comfort zone a little bit um, and, and really start to understand uh, the needs of other investors. Both of my partners are really brilliant and, and in their own right and what they do. And we all were able to kind of put our heads together and, and leverage our expertise all coming from a different place to really buy an amazing asset and, and turn it into um, something that's going to be very profitable for all of us. So I'm really proud of that deal, just being able to negotiate with the seller to even get him to sell it to me um, and for us to be able to, to figure out how to put it together uh, to get it financed and done. And now we've been successfully implementing the plan to reposition that asset. So I'm handling the asset management, um, the, the turning over of the units, um, the raising of the rents, those types of things, working with the property manager. So it's, it's a rewarding project. Um, it's going to be very lucrative, um, both you know, monthly and on the back end as well. Um, so I, I think it's probably one of my best deals. So we are about to wrap this up. Uh, I just wanted to find out if you uh, can recommend any book to beginners and, uh, and maybe advanced investors as well. Sure. So there's two books that I recommend, and one of them is probably not what you're thinking. It's not really so much a financial book, but it's a book that I just recently read that was recommended to me called Life and Air. And Life and Air, yes. Life and Air. And yes. it's, so I you, have, have you read, I read it? Him. No, I, I met him. Wonderful. At the event, but I still got to read the book. Yes. Yeah, so Life and Air is written kind of more as a novel, but there's a lot of golden nuggets about life. And really, you know, people want to pursue money because they think if I have money, I can do all these things. Right. But they don't realize sometimes in the pursuit of that money, we become a slave to um, the money and the debt that, and the time that's required to, to get more money. And really, when we start off with money as the goal, and if I just had this much money, I could do it we can kind of get off in all kinds of directions that cause stress for us and rob our time and our joy instead of saying, you know, here's the vision for my life that I want and here's what's going to make me fulfilled. And what can I do in order to get that life and that vision? And so when I'm pursuing an asset, whether it's a single family house or a flip or a larger multifamily, or I want to be an active or passive investor, you want to kind of think about, is this activity, even though it will bring me money, going to fit within my vision for life and what will bring us joy? And, you know, sometimes you do have to work hard and spend time on things that you don't want to do because of the bigger picture, but it's all about balance and making sure that everything you're doing, you have a purpose for. Um, so it's a book that I highly recommend um, just from a philosophical standpoint. I'm going to read that book now. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, Anna. For You're welcome. Coming on the show. Really appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it as well. Have a nice weekend. You too. Thank you. Bye.